awesome. All I want to ask you is, did you get your greens today? I got mine. Uncle Jackson Neb from the Nile Valley Movement, Shock Out Moshe Brother. Shout out to uh, Sun in the Studios, House of Consciousness, Black News 102. And shout out to the Moors too, because um, I would be wasting my time if I don't have the attention of the Moors with this presentation. Because number one, they themselves, our Moorish family members, um, are under a lot of. Uh, incorrect assumptions and conclusions and if it forces that alone forces them to make um, incorrect assertions or unfounded assertions um, or assertions that are grossly out of context and so um, yeah uh, that's what this presentation is about I want to try to refrain from being antagonistic with the information but sometimes you know we like to have a little fun you know we take jabs at each other you know, and it's all in fun. I mean, you know, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to be the boring Europeans. We don't want to emulate that boring monotone uh, behavior when we're presenting information. We, we, uh, we have a lot of energy. You understand what I'm saying? So sometimes we put that into our dialogue and our discourse. And a lot of times people think, oh, these guys are crazy or it's negative. It's, it's not that. We're just having fun, you know. We're just letting off steam and uh, passion. It's a lot of passion. You know, we're passionate about knowledge, truth, and information. So uh, that's what you're going to get with uh, this presentation um, uh, dealing with the Moors. You're going to get, um, uh, number one, the number one thing you're going to get from this presentation is you're going to get facts. And you're going to get facts, information, and knowledge that the Moors, for all the stuff that they talk, they never seem to want to talk about. You know, the Moors will give you sound bites. And then they, they'll give you sound bites. And then they'll uh, attach it possibly to a name without giving a real, real um, uh, 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 research note. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Sharif Bey, what he did at the debate with um, uh, uh, Brother Reggie. He, um, Brother Reggie. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> I love Reggie to death. Uh, that's my brother. Um, he, uh, presented information that showed certain black scholars saying that um, the Moors were from Africa and the Moors, uh, this, that, and the other. And then he showed their, their face and said a name like check into Diop or Dr. Ben or so and so on, but he never showed a page number and a paragraph so that I, somebody like me could go research it or somebody like yourself could go research it and watch it. That's not how you prove a point. You understand what I'm saying? That's not how you, that's not how you went around. That's not how you, that is not how you are victorious in debate. The most that you've done is you've created a distraction in your favor and you haven't really taught. And what I'm saying is that if you're going to present the information, then teach people in the process. You understand what I'm saying? And I don't think, I, I personally think that the Moors fail to do that. Now, I don't watch a lot of things on the Moors. I, I really don't. Um, the few things that I have seen 
um, uh, over the years, it's been like here and there because I'm really, for the most part, I'm really personally not too interested in the subject. What I'm interested in, what I'm very interested in, is protecting black minds from historical falsehood. That's what I'm interested in doing. Protecting black minds from historical falsehood. And I think one of the best ways to do that, if not the only way, is to do the requisite research. Do the research and then share with your people what you have found. Now, if you have, if you have the requisite, if your mind is hardwired to research at a very, very, um, uh, 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 I don't want to say high level, but at a very in-depth level, when you're hardwired to research at a very in-depth level, you're going to present information to people that they've never seen before, that they've never heard before, ever. If you're not doing that, then I think your research is a waste of time and that you're wasting other people's time. You're just regurgitating things that everyone has already heard before. But the only way to do that is you have to read real scholarly text. You understand what I'm saying, Sonetta? You have to read real scholarly text. You, it's not just about going online and, and watching a few lectures here and there. You have to really go into the archives. You got to go into the archives of universities. You have to read people's uh, PhD theses, things of that nature. You know, and, and you have to read whole books quite often. Whole books. And not only that, your information should also be... Um, I think this should be the criteria. Your, your information should be up to date, as up to date as possible, at least relatively speaking, um, because bad information can also be up to date. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and the reason why I say bad information can be up to date is a lot of times you will have competing schools of thought. One school of thought might be closer to the truth. The other school of thought might be further away from the truth, but they might have published more recently. You understand what I'm saying? Sure. Talk about the importance of this up and coming lecture that you're going to be doing and the reason why you don't want to do it in a debate format because you want to be able to bring the people. Right. Now you ask the question. Let me answer. And you don't yeah. want to rush through a job. So talk about yeah. the importance of this lecture here. Okay. The importance of this lecture, of this presentation, is that when you come to a debate, what, what people fail to realize is that at the debates, you only get to see a small part of what the presenter actually bought. You understand what I'm saying? And then they have to do the rest later, and by that time, you moved on to something else, so you don't even really get all of the research. So the, the lecturer or the debater is left with all this research that they spent months preparing, and nobody, I mean, true, you could put it in the book form and then sell the book, make money from it, which is, I think is smart to do. So I do plan on putting some of this information in book form. And I'm, I'm working on a few books at, as we speak right now. Um, I still have to finish the rest of the um, Egyptian text uh, collations, but, and biblical collate collations, uh, which is just about done. But um, it's important to do a presentation like this so that the people can get the information distilled. They can get it in a linear fashion, distilled, sequentially, straight through, without being interrupted, without having their minds have to be subject to a ping pong game of information. You have to go back and forth so that by the time you leave, you've heard, it's a form of dialectics. You've heard side A, you've heard some of, you heard some of side A, some of side B, but you didn't get to hear all of what any side had to say. So you really left with very fragmented, um, you're left more with the idea of who won rather, with, rather than how much information you could have actually left with. And I think that that's a bad trade-off. You understand what I'm saying? It's an it's a, it's a, it's a unfortunate trade-off. When, when you leave this presentation, you're going to leave with a different world view. That's what you want. You don't want to leave with the idea of who won, who lost. Because then it's just, you just went for the sport rather than for the knowledge and the information. By coming to see this presentation, uh, if you're smart, you come because you will never see anything like it again. 
and you never know what's going to be put on YouTube and what's not going to be put on YouTube. You never know what's going to be put on DVD and what's not going to be put on DVD. So if you're somebody who wants to be in possession of the best available facts about this subject matter, the Moors, number one, and a lot, we really have to do this thing on the Moors because there's been a lot of stuff published on the, on the Moors. However, unfortunately, a lot of that information did not do justice to the subject matter. And the reason that they did not do subject justice to the subject matter is because they had an agenda. And that includes the work of one of our esteemed elders, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, who did an illustrious work, well, quote unquote, uh, he, he did a work called The Golden Age of the Moors. It's somewhere over there in my library. And, or it might be over here somewhere. Now, I think that the Golden Age of the Moors has a great, has, has a wealth of information. The problem is that the Golden Age of the Moors set out with an agenda, and that agenda was to prove that, um, number one, the Moors were black, and that the Moors uh, 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 con uh, uh, made great contributions to civilization. That was the agenda of the book. The problem with that is that, the problem with that premise, and I'm sure Brother Reggie would love this, the problem with that premise is that it skirts around and doesn't even bring into the discussion and the dialogue so much other relevant information that will help you put the whole Moorish identity uh, 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 into perspective. In fact, there's a woman, I forget her name, um, she's a PhD doctor, uh, I can just look up on my computer and find it in a few seconds. But there's a woman, a doctor, I was actually reading her PhD dissertation this morning. Her whole dissertation is on African-American writers who use the more in Spain um, in their literature uh, 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 as it relates to a wider agenda. And therefore, it takes some things out of context and it ignores a lot of things when it comes to this Moorish identity. And I strongly recommend that you read her work. I strongly recommend that you read her work. In fact, while I'm sitting here talking, I'm going to bring it up so I can give you the name. Because this, when people are talking about the Moors, the conversation is so limited. Because most people are not really well, sub, are not really well studied on the subject matter. In fact, if I remember correctly, I had her down here at the bottom. Here she is, right here. Uh, yes. Her name is Maria Cristina Ramos. I'm going to say her name again. Maria Cristina Ramos. Ph.D. Okay? You need to read her work on the Moors. Because what it does is it... It, what it does is it checks the Moorish dialogue that we have to deal with in the black community. And, the, and I respect the black communities, and it's much wider than you think. You have a lot of black people who identify with the Moorish identity. And there's nothing wrong with identifying with it as long as you understand it. The problem is that most people who identify with it don't understand it. They don't understand the term, and they don't understand the history of the term and what the term was subjected to, how it mutated through history, where it originally came from, and how it mutated through history, and the role that Europeans played in giving it its definition. You understand what I'm saying? They don't talk about these things. They just say the Moors were black, we're the Moors, and we're responsible for A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yeah, but the problem with doing that is that you're pretty much working with a manufactured identity. It's manufactured. You understand what I'm saying? Not only is it manufactured, but it is ambiguous. Meaning that it is not it's, it's ambiguous and it's ephemeral. It's not it's not this concrete term that's just located in history, started here. You know what I'm saying? It's, you know, it's not like when you talk about Nile Valley civilization. When you talk about Nile Valley civilization, you know that you're talking about a specific river valley. It's located geographically. You understand what I'm saying? 
It's located geographically. Now, when you say the same thing to the Moors, the Moors will say, oh, we can locate us geographically. Moor comes from Morocco. Well, we know it doesn't come from Morocco. Okay? We know it doesn't come from Morocco because the Moors themselves will tell you that they trace the word back pre-Morocco. So if you can trace the word and the term back pre-Morocco, then stop saying that the word is affiliated and it comes from Morocco because it doesn't. You understand what I'm saying? So, so, so we have to take a, we have to take a different approach with, with with the whole Moorish identity. What I can tell you is that when you come to this presentation, and I strongly recommend that you come, because you're going to see things that you've never seen before. You're going to hear things that you've never heard before, and every single thing that I show you in this presentation, you will probably be able to fact check me right there at the presentation on your phone. All you got to do is get on your phone and just look up what I'm saying and you'll see whether or not if it's true. And then the first thing that you're going to do by the time I'm done is you're probably going to discard the whole Moorish identity. You're probably going to say, yeah, that was a part of our history, but let's put it into context so that I don't have to identify with the term, self-identify with the term more. I don't think that identifying with the term more is advantageous to us as a people um, uh, when it comes to the wider historical picture. And I think that that's the reason why Dr. Why, why, it's the reason why real grandmaster teachers like Dr. Ben and uh, Professor John Henry Clark and others, Sheikh Antidiop and others, that is the reason why there was such a thrust to head back to the Nile Valley. The thrust was not to head back to um, to Morocco. That was not the thrust. You understand what I'm saying? That was not the agenda. And so what you've got now is you have people who had their own agenda, who had attached themselves to these false historical ideologies as it pertains to black people. They attached themselves to these false historical ideologies, right? They invested time, energy, and effort by joining the Nation of Islam, joining the Moorish Science Temple, of America, um, uh, joining the black Hebrew Israelites, right? The Masons. Or, right, right. Or, 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 or the Masons is a little different, but or the Masons, so you can include them in there. But um, uh, I'm not a Mason or anything, but because um, they can hear him now. Oh, he said the Masons are different, so now he must be a Mason. No. Um, so what, I, what I'm saying is that they invested all this time and energy into these false historical ideologies as it pertains to African identity? Because at the end of the day, that's what it all comes down to, African identity. Some people want to say black identity. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with saying black identity. I don't have a problem with saying African identity because to me, they are synonymous. They are one and the same. If you are historically grounded in facts and truth, then they can only be one and the same. Black equals African, African equals black. Now, that said, the mistake that they made, Sonetta, was that they invested themselves, their time, energy, and resources in these false identity or in these, in these um, uh, 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 manufactured historical identities. And the problem with it is that in the manufacturing of these, of these, of these historical identities, what we did was we appropriated and heaped upon ourselves false premises. Or what in ancient Kemet we call isfet. They're called isfet. The opposite of ma'at. If you want to call them lies. So we have appropriated, we have appropriated, we have appropriated a lot of historical lies about our historical identity. But even as it pertains to these appellations that we put on ourselves, like Moors, or Hebrew Israelite, or uh, uh, what was the other one, um, uh, uh, or, or any of the other ones, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the manufactured ones. So that's what this presentation is all about. Um, I was listening, I, I said, you know, I listened to these Moors talk, and by the way, uh, I'm, I'm not even, I'm almost, I'm just getting started with my PowerPoint. I'm just getting started on the Circle 7 Quran. I really feel bad for the Moors um, when it comes to that Circle 7 Quran. Because I'm going to do things to it that no other scholar has done to it. When it comes to dismantling it and showing you why it is not something that black people can 
ground themselves in historically and say that that is a legitimate identity for us to champion on into the future. By the time I'm done with it, we're going to leave this identity here in the present. And um, for the most part, those new minds that are learning or reaching out for information and knowledge, they're not going to have any use for the Moorish um, uh, identity. They're just not going to have any use for it because it's going to be put into context. You understand what I'm saying? And those of us who, those of us, the majority of black, let me explain something to you. Seeking, the, the reason we even having this discussion in the first place, Sarnetta, is it's a part of our history we don't talk about. The part of our history that we don't talk about, maybe because it brings us shame or something, is the very reason we have in this conversation is because of slavery here in America. That's the very reason we have in it. The reason we have in it is that, I like what somebody said, I forget who it was, I think it might have been Muta Baruka, the poet. But he said, slavery is not African history. Slavery interrupted African history. And so because slavery did interrupt African history, one of the, thing, one of the things that it did was it interrupted and robbed us, robbed us of a knowledge of self uh, and I, the key word here is identity. And black people, go ahead. My PowerPoint, just by the way, is, um, can you hear me? Is the mic on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my, my PowerPoint, by the way, is going to be about, um, it's going to be about, it opens up with identity wars. Because that's what this is all about. It's about a war of identity. And whoever wins this war of identity, that's where the resources are going to go. That's where the money's going to go. That's where the economy is going to go. That's where the families are going to go. So it's serious. All right, so the people say, all right, Shaka Amos. Yeah. What are you going to bring different from Sarah Sut and Seti? Good from, question. From Brother Reggie. Good question. What are you going to bring different? Hmm. Okay, well, let me say this. I watched the Moorish presentation of Sarah, my brother, by my brother Sarah Sut and Seti. Um, uh, the presentation that he did against uh, uh, Aline Bey, uh, his debate with Aline Bey. I watched the presentation that Ali Muhammad uh, had against... Um, Polite. No, no, not against uh, Polite. Um, um, Lord Abba. Against Lord Abba, yes. I watched the, present the presentation that, um, Ali, that Ali Muhammad, my other brother, had against Lord Abba. So these were two presentations that were given against the Moors. Um, I also, and, and I watched the presentation. I was there in person with the presentation that Brother Reggie gave against uh, Sharif Bey. So I've seen three presentations on the Moors. And what I've discovered um, as a result of my own research is that none of my brothers really went back far enough, other than Reggie, none of my brothers went back far enough to really deal with the Moors in a comprehensive way such that we could dismiss a lot of the nonsense and also put the actual facts in place like a stone wall mm -hmm. so that we don't, have to, we don't have to debate it anymore and we don't have to argue about it anymore and we can move on to other things. But the reason why this is important is because, <clears throat> you know, it's ironic that that African people, not all African people, but as black people, there is a part of us that I think there's a vacuum there because of what we went through here in this country that we feel we need to have an identity, a collective identity before we can move forward as individuals. Whereas white people, Europeans, particularly in America, they don't, and probably others as well, they don't feel, well, particularly white people, they don't really suffer from the need for that identity because their identity is bound to the present. You understand what I'm saying? It's bound to the relative present and historical beginnings of this country. The average white person in America don't give a damn about what happens in London, England, Paris, France. All they care about is America because that's what their identity is bound up in. You know, their white, white person will tell you a minute, what I love about a white immigrants, what they tell you about America is what I love about America, it allows you to forge a new identity. So these are people who are looking to break with the past. Why? Because their new identity is predicated on the number one thing that America is about. Money. Currency. 
America is about money. Curry always has been. I don't know most places that are not on this planet, but America particularly, its identity is tightly bound with money. Yeah. As you sat there and watched our brother Reggie debate with brother Sharif. Right, thank you for getting me back on point. At any time, did you say to yourself, damn, I wish I was up there at that moment? Oh, yes, through the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Talk about that. And why? Why would you felt like that? Basically because those things that really need to be talked about were not, at least from my opinion and my perspective, not talked about. I, Reggie spoke about um, the early admixture of the Canaanites because we're going back to identity now. Remember I said this is all about identity. Mm -hmm. And the Moors predicate themselves on a Canaanite identity. That's what they predicate their whole identity on. It starts with Canaan, particularly with Moab. Don't forget I asked you too earlier, what would you do different? Right, so. right. Thank you very yeah. much. So um, what, what, what Reggie did was he dealt with that Canaanite identity at a very early period to show that Canaan, by the time they were on the world stage, they had already mixed, the Canaanites had already mixed with Neanderthals. Therefore, because modern humanity in that region mixed with a throwback version or an alternate version of humanity, Neanderthal, that that was not a history that we should be reaching out for to identify ourselves by. And I agree with it. But what I'm saying is that that point did not really speak to the heart of people who are trying to understand these identities. If you go on Facebook right now, you got so-and-so Bay, uh, um, Alicia McKenzie Bay, um, uh, m m um, a lot of these black sisters on Facebook, on social media, identify themselves as Moabitess, a female Moabite. But if you ask any of these black females about ancient Moab, they can't tell you shit about it. They're completely ignorant about it. They're dating some Moorish guy. You had, they're having sex or cohabitating with some Moorish guy who doesn't know his ass from his elbow, who has told them we are the Moors and our identity goes back to ancient Moab. And the reason we ended up in Morocco is because a pharaoh, some particular pharaoh, gave a Moabite king permission to go over here in the Maghreb and set up shop and that's how Morocco came into existence and so we are actually Moabite royalty and these ignorant black females eat this stuff and they swallow it they do no research none at all show me one published paper by a by a self described Moabitess or Moorish female that is published with at least a master's or a PhD on, on Moabite history. You don't see it. At least Drusilla John G. Houston wrote a book, the um, what is the um, ancient Ethiopians of the Kushite Empire, right? She at least at least she she wrote. I mean, some of her stuff was was factual and, and good, and some of it had to be. Some of it is questionable, but at least she made an effort to publish serious work. So what I'm saying is that, and this is to my sisters, because I want to speak respectfully to you. Those of you who identify yourselves as Moabites or Moors, because you are dating somebody or because some black brother told you, or they don't call themselves black because they think that black is, um, it doesn't tell your nationality and blah, 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 all this other shit, which is, you know, true, I guess, but... Um, that also presupposes that nationality itself then um, uh, uh, presupposes other things. But in any event, let me tell you something. Nationality doesn't stop you from being invaded or enslaved. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So uh, uh, you cannot have a nationality but still thrive as a collective um, as long as you can protect yourselves. You know, so in any event, um, speaking to my sisters, the, uh, uh, I have to slow my mind down because I've been doing a lot of research and my mind is still flying through all of that stuff. But 
to my Moabite sisters. And I'm going to take the same approach as I did when I was dealing with the Hebrew Israelites, when I was dismantling their stuff. Um, a lot of my message was not really for the Hebrew males. Because the Hebrew males, I mean, so many of them left the Hebrew Israelites because of the work of people like myself and Brother Polite and others. Um, we know we did our job. But my real message was for the Hebrew Israelite sisters. Because for the most part, you are the ones that are raising the children. I passed this Hebrew Israelite school that you have over here in Harlem on St. Nicholas, I think uh, on 100, between 117th and 118th Street. And I said to my God, oh my God, all these young black minds being miseducated about Hebrew identity. So imagine if we could get to the Hebrew sisters and say, look, these Hebrew brothers that have educated, have miseducated you, have miseducated you. Let me talk to you and show you some real history about even about your Israelite identity that you don't know about. Because if you knew about it, you wouldn't be investing yourself in that identity. And so I'm saying, I'm saying, so therefore, I'm saying the same thing to our Moabite sisters. Come and talk to your brother. Address me. If you want to make a video and put it on YouTube, I'm fine with that too. What I'm saying is, stop letting your brothers, even myself, stop letting your brothers just say things and then you go, okay, you know, or you let them show you one or two little things and then you say, yeah, that makes sense, brother. I'm with you. And then you buy into that identity because then brothers like myself, we have to come along and we have to undo all of that brain damage, all of that mental surgery that was done on your mind. It just makes our job that much harder because now we have to, we have to, it just gives us one more hill that we have to climb and try to connect with our sisters. Because as brothers and sisters, we need to connect. But if we are going to connect, let's connect on some truth. If it's from an identity perspective, let's do it based on truth and facts so we can genuinely appreciate ourselves. We can celebrate who and what we are. You understand what I'm saying? Rather than defending historical identities uh, 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 predicated on false ideologies and lack of information and misinformation. You understand what I'm saying? I appreciate, um, I appreciate Noble Drew Ali's effort. Now I'm dealing with Noble Drew Ali, the brother, the, 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 uh, the, the ancestor. I appreciate I appreciate our brother's effort. So answer the question. Um, well, what, what would I have done differently? Yeah, no, no. What, what will you bring different from the general and from Brother Reggie and from Dr. Number Dr. one, Obama? number one, they did not go back far enough. Reggie went back far enough, but he didn't go back far enough in the right area. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Reggie went back far enough, but he didn't go back far enough in the right area in order to be able to deal with the right things that would speak to people so that they could understand why this whole Moorish identity is grossly misunderstood, mostly by the Moors themselves. They're the ones who understand it the least. Why? Because they already bought into the identity. So because they bought into the identity, and I'm not, I'm not saying that the identity does not serve a purpose. Now, if you want to, that's a whole different discussion. If you want to say, well, does the Moorish identity serve a, a purpose? Any identity can serve a purpose if you use it right. But we're not just appropriating identities to ourselves just for the sake of um, um, appropriating identities. We're appropriating, we, the reason why we are uh, uh, still involved and re-establishing our identity is because we are trying to restore what was undone by virtue of slavery, by virtue of Jim Crow, by virtue of the civil rights, by virtue of white domination uh, in the past 500 years. Actually longer than that, for the past 2,000 years. Because of white domination, European domination, for the past 2,000 years, African people, black people, have had to work overtime in reestablishing our historical identities. Plural. I didn't say identity singular because we do have multiple identities. We weren't, we've never been a monolithic people. We have always been many different people at the same time. 
So yeah, we can go back in our history and say, well, yeah, you know, at one period, we were defined and described as Moors, but then we have to say, but here's why. At this period. And then we have to say, okay, at this period, the term Moor was placed on us, but it didn't mean the same thing as Moor at this period. So you have to make these distinctions. You understand what I'm saying? They're very important. They're very important to make. But anyway, the name of the PhD, the PhD paper that you should read is um, Literary Cartographies of Spain, Mapping Identity in African-American Travel Writing by Maria Cristina Ramos, PhD, 2011. So that's relatively recent. That's relatively recent. I'm going to say it again. Literary Cartographies of Spain, Mapping Identity in African American Travel Writing by Maria Cristina Ramos, PhD, 2011. You need to, um, I would suggest, strongly suggest you read it because she speaks at length about what the Moors were and what they were not and how people from outside of the whole experience came to use the term and employ the term and how we adopted it and said, okay, yeah, that's who we, what we are. The same way with the term Negro. We never called ourselves Negro. That's not an indigenous African term. That's not a term from, that's not even a term from Asia that black people in Asia use to describe themselves. That's something that was put upon us by the Portuguese. Okay? So, you know, we have to be careful about these terms that we invest in to define ourselves. Okay, so one of the things that I'm going to be doing different that they did not do is I'm going to take you back to the right area that you need to look at and understand to understand, number one, why uh, the term more really does not relate to anything African. Okay, it's not... It's not an African identity, okay? Uh, it became associated, that's what I'm saying. The term became associated with African identity, but so did a whole lot of other things, derogatory terms, nigger, bushman, hottentot. Those terms also became associated with African identity. That don't mean that that's who we were. The same thing with the term more it became associated and affiliated with African identity. And not always for honorable reasons. A lot of times it was for very dishonorable reasons. It was for um, deprecating reasons or depreciated, depreciable reason, uh, uh, reasons. So um, when you come to this presentation, you're gonna have the opportunity of witnessing with your very own eyes, me taking you back to the appropriate geographical uh, regions that you need to be looking at to understand, number one, most importantly, the Morris Science Temple of America. Because it's the Morris Science Temple of America that are the greatest propagators of this Morris identity. So I'm really gonna be dismantling the work of um, Noble Juali. I'm gonna be dismantling his text, the Circle 7 Quran, and I'm going to show you why it's all based on falsehood, misunderstanding, and most importantly, an incorrect approach to restoring our black minds and our African identities. Okay? Even, it's even incorrect if you want to restore your ancient Asian identity because a lot of black people are caught up in this original Asiatic black man. See, the Moors wanna, the Moors want to, uh, they wanna play both sides of the fence. They wanna be in a ping pong game with themselves. They wanna, um, they wanna extol the whole original Asiatic black man identity, while at the same time claiming African identity. Am I right or am I wrong? They want to claim both. They want to say, well, we are the original Asiatic black people and we are also um, African people. You understand what I'm saying? 
So, you know, we, we did this, we did that, we did this in Africa. We are such and such and such. They're confused. But I'm, go I'm also going to show you why the Moors are confused. You will not understand why the Moors are confused unless you look at the very history, the actual history that they are claiming. To claim to be a Moor, to have a Moor who, had, who has descended from ancient Moab, in 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 the, in in, uh, in the Transjordan region, in, in the Levantine region, the Levant. When you claim that identity, you are automatically claiming a confused identity. Automatically, from the outset, you are claiming a confused identity. Why? Because most people who claim that identity have no knowledge, they have, they possess no knowledge of how that identity came into being. So if you're coming to me as a Moor from the Moorish Science Temple and you're saying that we are Moabites, that, that, that black people in America are descended from the Moab, the Moabites of Moab, that tells me that you're a stupid person, an ignorant person, because you don't know anything about ancient Moab, how it came into being. So what would be your question for any more, if you had the opportunity to ask some more a question, what would be your question? My question would be, how did ancient Moab come into being? How did it come into being? When did it come into being? Because those are going to be two very popular. We're going to just deal with the who, what, when, where, why. Right? And I like to reverse it because we've been taught by Europeans, which means that quite often, not all the times, but quite often they get things wrong. No, I need the microphone. No. Okay. We right here. All right. All right, so yeah, basically, um, back to this whole uh, Moorish thing, uh, what I want people to realize is that everything that you're being told about the Moors, whether it's the Moorish Science Temple uh, or, the, or the actual historical Moors, the, the majority of which what you're being told is incorrect, it is wrong, okay? So it's just plain flat out wrong because they're missing the actual beginning of the story. They think that the story, this whole thing with the Moors, uh, goes back to, uh, to Moab. Now, if it goes back to Moab, if they're saying that the identity that they're claiming goes back to Moab, then we have to look at Moab and what happened in Moab. And that's what my presentation is going to be about. It's going to be about what happened in Moab and why we cannot use Moabite identity to tell the world that that's who we are because it's nonsensical and it makes no sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. The Moabite identity is a manufactured identity, whether you're speaking about it as it relates to the Moors or even if you're speaking about it as it relates to um, their own historical reality. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to show you the documentation. I'm going to show you the documentation, how Moab came into being, why they came into being, who these people were. These are no big players on the stage of civilization. These aren't people that made any real contribution to civilization or any contribution to civilization. They really didn't do shit. So what is the point of saying, oh, I'm a Moabite? What, the, what did they do? They really didn't do anything. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, so, I mean, the reality of it is that None of these Iron Age states did anything, made no real contributions to civilization. They, what they, they were recipients of civilization. They received civilization from the older, bigger uh, uh, civilizations. That's why most of the time they were client states. Why are we tracing our history back to client states? If we want to be, if we want to talk about a, if we want to talk about a, um, a, 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 tracing our history back to to, to global superpowers. That's the whole purpose of doing this. The whole purpose of, of reclaiming our history is to say, look, you know, America or Western civilization, you're not the first people to have a superpower. As black people, as African people, we represented in the, in the old world or in the primal world, we represented the superpowers. You understand what I'm saying? Or, or the super of the superpowers. And we point to Egypt, yes, as one of them, you know? And then we have to look at other, other civilizations that those Iron Age states were surrounded by. They were surrounded by the Hittites. 
They were surrounded by um, uh, uh, the Assyrians, right? You have to look at the impact that Assyria had on these civilizations. You had to look at the impact that Egypt had on these civilizations. And, and then you have to look at the identity of these civilizations and, and how they related to the big boys on the block. So I'm not interested. I mean, if you want to claim it and claim it all and say, okay, well, yeah, that was us. All right, go ahead and do that. I just don't see the point that it, that, that, it, that it serves today because their identity, all of these states, Israel, Moab, Amon, um, uh, 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 who else would I, would I list under there? Uh, those are the main ones. Israel, Moab, and, 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 and Ammon. And maybe even um, uh, 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 the Arameans as well. All of these people got their identity. Their identities that are manufactured identities because they got their identities um, in reacting to what was going on to, with the bigger boys. Egypt. Assyria, even Babylon. You understand what I'm saying? That's where these people got their identity from. So what is the point of going back to Moab to claim an identity that was manufactured in the Iron Age? It was manufactured in the Iron Age as a reaction of everything going on around it. And they didn't do shit. You know, oh, I'm a Moabite. Well, what did Moabites do? Did they invent any math? Did they invent any science? They didn't do shit. They had they had an unusual um they had an unusual form of agriculture where you where you where you grew your crops underneath the ground because they had riverbeds under the ground. Okay, well that's interesting. But what the fuck did they do? When you look at their when you look even when you look at their art, they're too busy trying to copy Egypt just to be something. So why do I want to claim the imitator when I can claim the original? You understand what I'm saying? In one minute, and I'm going to show you something. I wish I had a picture up here. I should have had it. I'm, I'm going to find that picture. When you look at Moors, this is to give you a hint of what you're going to see in my presentation. When you look at Moors, I wish there was a picture I could find right now. I'm going to try to find it right now. Um, Moors, right? So when you look at the picture of a Moors, I hope to God I could find this picture. I should have had it ready and waiting. There's a very... Um, uh, uh, popular picture that I'm always seeing of a more. Oh, I wish I could find that picture right now. I should have had it ready. But uh, oh, I know where it is. I know exactly where it is. These moors. My moors. Oh, this one here. These moors. They want to claim every symbol under the sun. Right? Where's that? Where's that? More PowerPoint. Here we go. Right? These Moors want to claim every symbol under the sun. There's a reason for it. They want to have, here it is right here. I'm glad I got this picture. I want to pull it up. I hope you can pull this up and get it on camera. Remember how you used to get me on camera? Mm -hmm. You need to do that some more because the people like that. Tools, adjust sides. I'm going to make them blow this sucker up. Matter of fact, I'm going to blow it really big so we can see. <coughs> okay, save. Right? Um. Oh, shit. Let me go back in. I thought I pulled it out. Here we go. Boom. I'm going to show you this so you can see this. Here we go. All right. Boom. Look at this picture. All right. This is the type of shit I'm talking about. Right. This says, can you, can you get that camera? Can you get it on there? Mm -hmm. I'm this in says, all hail the great Moabite Moorish woman. Okay. Now, matriarch. She's the matriarch of the human family. Do you hear this dumb shit? This is the dumbest, this is the kind of stupid shit that Moors put out. All hail the great Moabite Moorish woman. Matriarch of the human family. Now how the fuck? I'm sorry. <laughs> how can a Moorish woman be the matriarch of the human family when... There was no such thing as a Moor in the Bronze Age. And we already had matriarchs before 1200 BCE when the Iron Age begins. In fact, when is, I mean, if you just go back to Queen Mentu Hotep, um, yeah, Queen Mentu Hotep in the Middle Kingdom. 
That's in the Bronze Age. Think about it. Imhotep's mother, mm. who's in the Bronze Age, is not the matriarch of humanity. Norma, King Norman's mother is not the matriarch of humanity. King Zosa's mother is not the matriarch of humanity. You're going to pick an identity that doesn't come into existence until the Iron Age, 1200 BCE, and then they still got to go a few more centuries about, let me see, 100, 200, 300, about another 400 years before they get enough. They got to go at least 400 years. These Moors, so-called Moabites, have to go at least four to 500 years into the Iron Age before they even get an identity, a core identity. Okay, maybe 200 years before they get an identity. And all of a sudden, she's the matriarch of humanity, of the human family? You sound stupid. Like, you don't know anything about history and can't count. You Moors. You're fucking retards. You all got to stop with this shit. Stop miss. You, I understand you love Noble Drew Ali, but when I show you how Noble Drew Ali fucked your minds up, you, you're going to be, get, you're going to, I'm going to make you throw them feathers away. I'm telling you right now. All them feds, when you walk on 125th Street, you're going to see a mountain and a heap of feds that people threw away. We're going to donate them. I'm going to tell you the country we're going to donate them to, too, at the presentation. Because you'll say all this dumb shit. And if you notice, look what she got in her hand. She got the Ankh. Right? She got the Crescent and the Star. Uh, the Crescent and the Star. I'm going to show you why she got that. I got no problem with that. The Star of David. The Masonic symbol. Uh, the, um... Uh, the zodiac sign, the pyramid. So I mean, it's like the Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, what are y'all saying? I mean, what are you saying? I, I mean, what is this kind of nonsense saying? Y'all just want to claim every symbol, so you're the custodians of all the culture, all the symbol. Okay, I mean, well, no problem. I'm just not trying to claim everything. I have no interest in claiming Hebrew Israelite. I have no interest in claiming. Um, uh, the Muhammad story uh, 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 with, with, with Allah and, and, uh, I'm, no, I'm not interested in claiming that as a person of African descent I'm interested in claiming African culture African high culture you understand what I'm saying as represented by its greatest ambassadors which is Nile Valley civilization I have, I, I have no need to claim Iron Age states because there is no... How are you going to compare Moab to ancient Egypt? That's stupid. So what is the point of claiming Moab? What is the point? What did they produce? Show me the mathematical, show me the mathematical and scientific treaties Moabites produced. Writing. Uh, Moab, Moabites produced writing? Writing, right. How could Moabites produce writing if their identity did not come into existence until the Iron Age? Writing predates the Iron Age. The, the pyramid texts long predate the Iron Age. The pyramid texts go back to the 3rd millennium BCE. And in fact, writing, we're talking about writing, actual writing. See, a lot of people like to tell you this bullshit about um, the hieroglyphics or the, or the Medunetra is the first writing of the Egyptians. That's a lie. It's false. Because they don't know their homework. They don't know the subject matter. You ever heard of something called heretic? Mm -hmm. Heretic is actual writing. It is a script. It is not pictograph. It is a script. The evidence shows that the, the script, heretic, predates the hieroglyphic. But they don't want to talk about that. They don't want to talk about that because they're stupid. All these people that are promoting these ideologies, they are ignorant. They are miseducated and they are stupid. And for some reason, and I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to insult them. Uh, okay. Rather than insult them and call them that, let me just say that they are misinformed and they have not seen the body of evidence that I'm going to present. And maybe it's not your fault. But the reason why I get so angry and frustrated with them, I'll use the term frustrated. The reason why I get so frustrated with them, Sonetta, is because if you're going to be doing your research, then damn it, do research. Stop pretending to do research. Are you mad 
or are you kind of upset that Reggie didn't do what he do what you know he can do? Well, I don't know if he can do it. If he could do it, he would have did it. I know I can do it, and that's why I'm doing it. That's why I'm doing this presentation on the Moors. I don't care if one person show if we you know if one person shows up, fine. But I guarantee you one thing: all of you will have missed the facts, and you will have you will remain another hundred to two hundred years in ignorance, maybe for all time. Running with this Moorish identity and this Hebrew Israelite identity, you're running around with Iron Age state identities. These identities are manufactured hybrid identities. They borrowed from older cultures. So if they borrowed from all the cultures and gave them a new twist and gave them new definitions, then they can't be dealing with truth. You understand what I'm saying? They can't be dealing with truth. They're dealing with uh 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 they're dealing with subjective interpretation. They're not dealing with facts. You understand what I'm saying? These people who think Yahweh is a universal God. Hebrew is it. How can Yahweh be a universal God when history shows for a fact that Yahweh was just one of many gods found in Canaan that had been delivered to it from Egypt? Just a hybrid God, another hybrid God. You got to remember, you, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you did not make it sense. Part two tomorrow.